the way medication goes into the system is so important as nurses. Because if you make a mistake and you give the same amount of medication IV that you will give somebody PO because your patient is MPO because of whatever, well, you know what will happen to your patient, right? So pharmacokinetics and absorption, distribution, metabolism, and excretion. And uh, there are many ways to put medications into the system. You could do a topical in a transdermal or mucosal way. You could do an enteral, which is PO. You give it to your patient through the mouth. So lingual, which, what is a lingual? Where do you put people, where do you put medications with lingual? Under the tongue. Under the tongue. Under the tongue. How about buccal? In the cheek. In the cheek. My question is, when you're giving somebody buccal or sublingual medication, can they drink water? Can they drink it? No, they need to let it dissolve. No. Right, they need to let it dissolve, right? Otherwise, it would not be buccal or sublingual. It would be peel, right? And then you have your parental medications, intradermal, subcutaneous, IM, IV, and some other ways, intraosseous, intratracheal, endotracheal. All of those are forms of giving medication to your patient. And the bioavailability of the medication is different in each one of them, and the dosages are different. So far, this is familiar, right, Zachary? Right, Maria? This is something that you know, right? Yes. It's just a review. Uh, the rate of absorption determines how soon the medication will take effect. If you give somebody a medication IV versus a medication PO, which one is going to take effect faster? IV. An IV medication, IV. right? If you give somebody a medication, a, 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 a pill versus a, uh, let's say, liquid, which one is going to be faster? Liquid. Guys, yeah, it's not a trick question. A liquid versus liquid. an IV medication. Oh, IV. IV. A liquid versus a pill. The liquid. Liquid. A liquid. That's right. Can you crush a standard release medications? No. no. Never. Right. So the bioavailability is the proportion of drugs that is absorbed. And when you do a PO, there's always something that is called the first pass effect. And where's the, the, where does the first pass effect takes place? In the liver. In the liver. liver. Right? So far, so good, right? You all know this. We don't need to go over this. Okay. I just want to make sure. So lingual, IB. Those are forms that bypass the liver. And if bypass the liver, bypass what? The first, first pass effect. effect, right? It will totally bypass the first pass effect. Meaning, whatever you give, it's going to have 100% bioavailability. If you give somebody 10 milligrams of Dilaudid, PO, is that a dangerous dose? Would that be a dangerous dose? The Larry, uh, it's, it's, guys, not a tricky question. PO, 10 milligrams, is a dangerous dose? No. Professor, no. But if you give 10 milligrams IV. That is, that is yes. toxic. That is toxic. Your patient will die. It will go into respiratory distress. And if you do it in my hospital, it's going to go to the fifth floor. And I only have four floors in my hospitals. So he's not going to make it, for sure. For sure. That's the reason why routes are so important. And for you to know dosages depending on the route that you're going to use. So far, so good, guys. So distribution is the transportation of medications to side of action in body fluid. Usually, they, 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 they attach to plasma protein. And the main protein they attach to is called what? 
albumin. Albumin, that's right. That's why it's so important to know the albumin level of your patients before you give medication. That's why every time you see all of those labs and those labs that you get in your, in your questions, the albumin level, it's a main subject. So two medications can compete for the same binding sites and that will result in toxicity. And then you have barriers in your body. One is the blood brain barrier and the other one, the placenta, right? And medications that are lipid soluble, they have their own transport system and they can cross those barriers. So far, so good, guys. Is this something that is familiar? Right? Is there anybody here do, who doesn't understand this? Anybody who doesn't remember this? No? No questions. We continue. Then you have metabolism, which is changing medications by the addition of enzymes. Right? And it happens in the liver. And Oh, I'm hearing myself like, and it decreases in all people and children. Why? Because their threshold is different. That's a very. I mean, so, so huge response. Metabolism is different. Yeah, their metabol like older people, they're older, so it's like, I don't know how to explain. How I know. Older. The liver, it's, it's 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 use is wasted. The it's liver absorption is wasted. For a long time, yes. it might be scar. That patient might be a drinker. Uh, and has scars in the liver. If they might have cirrhosis, or they just might be old. So the metabolism in all people, it's different. And in children, what happened with children? The liver it's is not mature. Not it's not that. mature enough yes. and the composition yes. of the body is different. So what do we do when we're talking about dosages referring to other people and children and metabolism? How are the dosages? It needs to be calculated specifically to the patient. Or by the, by the weight. Yeah, go ahead. Wait. In and children, uh, it's weight. In children, it's weight by their age. Guys, short answer: lower dosages. It's simple as that. The, the the dosages are going to be lower. Always. That's right. So depending on 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 the person and depending on 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 the age you're going to have different dosages. And then uh, there are some medications who are narrow therapeutic, meaning if you go too high, it's toxic. If you go too low, it's not therapeutic enough. And you have a steady state medications, which whatever you get, you get out. Some medications are steady state. They have no half-life. Whatever you get is what you get out. Some medications need pick and through. Have you heard this before? Do you know what pick and through is? Yes. Yes, professor. Why don't we do pick and through? Why? Why do we need to do this? Why don't we do pick and through with vancomycin to or with some other medication? To make sure the concentration on the blood about the medication. Right, before we give it and after we give it. Because these type of medications need to have an S specific concentration on the blood. Less than the specific concentration, it doesn't do anything. More than that, they become toxic. So when you're here in the hospital, pick and through, that's what we're talking about. There are few medications who need pick and through. So far, so good. We understand this. Yes. yes. Right? right. Excretion. Mostly it's produced where? The kidneys. Right. Kidneys. In the kidneys. So if your kidney is old, you might have an issue with excretion. If your patient is on dialysis, you might have an issue with excretion. Those are other factors and consideration to take into 
when you're giving medication to patients, right? So far, so good. Yes. We're good. Okay. I just want to make sure you know this. Half life. What is half life? Um, is the, the amount of medication. Tell me the reason why after six to eight hours you need to take Tylenol again. Why do you need to take Tylenol again? The you effect pass. Huh? Because effect pass, the effect of the, of the drug. In and the why, that, why does it pass? Why does it go away? Why not just one pill and that's it? I don't need to take it again. I just took it. Because what happened? You're, you're excreting it. You're excreting it. And how are you excreting it? Through your kidneys. Through your kidneys. And the process of excreting half of the medication or one half of the medication at big level is called what? Drug half-life. called drug half-life. Okay. That's what it is. Let's say you took 1,000 milligrams of Tylenol because you hit yourself and you're in pain. So you hit yourself, ah, and it hurts. It got swollen and prostaglandin is a substance that starts being produced right away, right? And it goes all the way to the brain and it tells the brain, hey, I'm in pain, do something, do something. And then you, you don't want that message going to the brain. What do you do? You take a Tylenol. What is a Tylenol? It's a medication that is going to inhibit prostaglandin. That doesn't mean that what you did to your arm is cure. What it means is that your that 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 where the tissue damage is, the prostaglandin is not going to be produced. And when that happens, you have no pain for a certain amount of hours. Now, after a couple hours, four, six hours, half of that medication is excreted. And then you have half of what you drank. And then after four to six hours, another half of the half is going to be excreted. And after a certain amount of hours, you have no medication whatsoever in the body because half life is happening. And when that happens, you know what happens? The, 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 the injury to the tissue is not gone, it's still there. So what happens is that prostaglandin is produced again. And you start feeling pain again. That's why quadriplegics and pad, uh, 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 don't feel any pain. Why? Because there is no nerve birth. The, 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 the nerves don't, don't, don't carry anything. So you can stab them in the leg and they don't feel anything. Because even if prostaglandin is being produced, it's not going to get to the brain. But in the case of a normal person, yeah, prostaglandin is going to go to the brain and you take Tylenol. After four to six hours, the Tylenol is not there anymore because the half-life is gone. And when that happens, you need to take it again. So you have to think about the fact that you have to keep on drinking medication because after a half-life, which is designed by whoever did the medication, after a certain amount of time, half that medication is going to go. For instance, let's say Tylenol is four to six hours and you, did, you, you, you drank 1,000 milligrams. After six hours, 500 milligrams should be out of the body. After 12 hours, another 150. You have no Tylenol in your body, then it's going to start heading again and you're going to need to drink what? More Tylenol to stop the pain. But what you're really stopping is the sensation of pain that happens because of the release of prostaglandin. So far, so good. Everybody understands this? Guys? Yes. You do? Okay. Pharmacodynamics. What, what does the medication does to your body? Cell receptors. <sighs> Medications are not magic. You don't drink it and then it, magic happens. No, medications are there to tweak your body. So what's going to happen is that they're going to attach to receptors and they're going to make the cell two functions that otherwise the cell would not do normally, such as stopping prostaglandin or increases or decreases the heart rate or causing vasoconstriction or vasodilation 
or 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 or, or speeding up the production of potassium or, or or the decrease in the production of potassium whatever it is that you want your body to do you do it with medications right so some cells have a specific receptors that can be stimulated if you stimulate that receptor if a medication stimulates a receptor it's called a agonist now I'm sorry guys, and I'm meeting somebody who wants to get in. The interaction with the receptor produces a change in the cell, which is intended to be therapeutic. Again, it doesn't make the cell do something that the cell doesn't do. No medication or vaccine for that matter is gonna make the cell make a function. Your cells don't do new functions. They do the same functions that they are there to do. The only, the only difference is that, that normally they will not do it, and the medication as an agonist is going to make them do that. Stop prostaglandin, and stop uh, sending cystam P or histamine or whatever it is to stop the pain. But if you give somebody too much opioid, too much medication for pain, opioid, what's going to happen to your body? Too much. Respiratory Overdose, distress. maybe? Respiratory Overdose. distress, right? And then you go there and you say, holy crap, I just gave my patient too much opioid. <sighs> Look, respirations are six. My patient is going to die. What do I do? CPR. Naxalon. No, you don't do CPR. Not you might not have to do CPR. Yeah. And then, uh, even and another drug that uh, maybe... Something that you can do. <laughs> There is something that you can do before CPR. Oh, the drug that can compete with the with the other drug. I mean, to inhibit the the action. Of That's the drug. called an antagonist. Antagonist. That is called an antagonist. So an agonist, it's going to put the cells to work. An antagonist is going to block. It's going to compete with the receptor, and then once you don't have the medication inside the cell, it goes back to its previous state which is, uh, I'm lazy, not doing anything. That's an antagonist. So it's like one's open the door and creates a reaction and the other one locks the lock. But you cannot open the door anymore. Is that understood what an antagonist and an agonist is? Yes. Yes. Right? OK, good. So some drugs can interact with the receptors, such as agonists, morphine. Some others can interact, uh, uh, okay, break down them before they can join the receptors. That's an antagonist. It's such as we could call it. It's not the best word, but it's an, an antidote, right? The antidote for an opioid would be an antagonist, which would be uh, 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 naloxone, right? Naloxone. Is that understood, guys? Yes. Yes. For for aspirin, for, sorry, for Tylenol. What's the what's the antagonist? Or or the antidote? It's I call acetyl 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 cysteine, right? Yes. It's like warfarin, vitamin K, like that kind of. That's thing. right. And for 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 benzodiazepines. Flu flumazol. Flumazicum. That's right. And and for barbitures. There is none. You start, there is you none. Start there is none. There is no antagonist for barbecue. If you, you give too much barbecue to your patient, you're going to have to go to ABCs because there's no antagonist for barbecues. Okay? No right. other medications are going to have antagonists. Professor, so, so why does it say, because I read it like not that long ago, it says you start charcoal. Well, charcoal is not an antagonist. What does it do? What does charcoal do? And you can only start charcoal finish. If, 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 and that's a very good question, by the way. So if your patient drank a whole bottle of barbecue an hour ago or an hour and a half ago, does it make any sense? No, because it's no. absurd. Because, yeah, because the absorption has occurred. You wouldn't use charcoal. Why? Because that are, that's already past the stomach and it's already into the lower intestine and it's already being attached. So there's no reason why you use, use 
try to pump up the stomach. Now, charcoal is gonna cover the stomach. It's like chapapote, like, 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 like something that is gonna cover the stomach and it's going to stop the absorption of the medication, PO. And then you can watch the stomach and try to get as much medication you get out of the stomach before it can actually reach the liver. But remember, when you're drinking medications PO, it takes certain amount of time. But once it's in the process of, 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 of being metabolized in the liver, you cannot open the liver and get the medication out. There is not a straight path to the liver. That doesn't exist. There is a straight path to the stomach. So I can give you medication and I can put charcoal in the stomach and I can I can cover it so nothing gets absorbed. So I, I, I put charcoal and then I try to get as much out. Get it out, get it out, get it out, get it out, get it out. But that's only if you had time to do it. If it's been more than a certain amount of minutes, you're not gonna have time. It's already in the system. So you have to go to ABCs and try to do measures to keep your patient alive. And maybe if you're lucky, do hemodialysis and, and, and try to keep that blood, right? So far, so good. Yes. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Okay. All right, you're welcome. So after an oral medication has been absorbed, most of the medication is inactivated after the body initially passes through the liver, producing a little therapeutic effect. How do you call that? First pass effect. That's right. First pass effect. Medications that are given orally are taken directly to the liver from the GI tract via hepatic pora band circulation. So medications will be completely inactivated as they pass through that process. And no therapeutic effect is going to occur at that time. Those medications must be administered by an enteral route. That's the reason why after a certain amount of time, it makes no sense to give carbon. You know, it makes just no sense. Intravenous administration uh, of a medication eliminates the need for what? Absorption. Correct. There is no absorption with intravenous. You have a vein, you put it in there, you shoot it. It's designed to go straight ahead into the bloodstream. It's an active metabolite already. You don't need to, 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 to absorb that medication. And it's just gonna keep on going and keep on going and do what it does in the body. What is the alternate name for biotransformation of a drug? Metabolism. 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 Biotransformation. It's when it gets to the liver and it transforms into something else, like the aspirin. I took this piece and I put this piece in the, as in the aspirin in the liver. Why? Because the people 50 is smart enough to say, this is designed for me and I want a medication that is water soluble. So let me take this off and let me put this on and let me take it into the bloodstream. But if you do an IV, don't need to do that, right? High protein bound drugs do what? They increase the risk for risk drug interaction, guys. When I'm missing two medications that are highly protein bound, they're both gonna go and they're gonna attach to albumin. They compete for binding sites of plasma proteins, such as albumin. So this competition is going to result that one of them is going to win, or both. And then the risk of having more in the body can lead to toxicity. The nurse needs to be aware that which factor will affect the absorption of oral, or orally administered medication. What do you think? If the presence of food in the stomach, as it's going to affect the absorption of orally, orally by mouth uh, medication. 
It could depend on the drug. It could be yeah. depending Definitely. on the medication. Hundred yes. percent. Yes. The pH of the stomach. Yes. 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 It works with the hydrochloric acid, and it works with pepsin. Yes. Now the patient position about intake of the medication. No. Not really. Yes. Not really. Not no. really. If you, if, if you can swallow it, it doesn't matter if you're Trendelenburg. You swallow it. And that's it. Form of a drug preparation? Yes. Yes. Time of the day? Biorhythm mm -hmm. site? Yes. Definitely. Most definitely. Most definitely. Right, guys? Do we yes. agree? Do we yes. agree with time? OK. The nurse understand that drugs exert their action on the body by what? Interacting with receptors. Do they interact with receptors? The nurse understand that receptors. They all interact with receptors, of course. Of course. See, inhibiting the action of specific enzymes. Do they make the cell perform a new cell function? No. <laughs> I wish they did. Can you imagine if you could take a medication that could rejuvenate your cells? They're working on it. <laughs> yeah, me too. I want that. I want a medication that takes the gray away from my beer by making my cells do new things. Not gonna happen. I have it. So if you want, we can oh, what, You know what you have? You have something that I'm gonna put to. to to, to dye my beard. I don't want to dye my beard. <laughs> you, I, I, just want, I just want, I just want yeah, something. I want to move, move the hair of my beard for, to my head. I'll take you to my, I'll take you to my, 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 my guy. Let's not get there, guys. People with, with no hair, with, with no hair here, they have a nice shaped head. Me, I have a lot of hair. You know why? Because my, my head looks like, 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 like una papaya así grande así. I thank God that I have hair. Otherwise, I, I will be, I will have this all the time. I can't be bald. God knows Pintatelo. that. Pintatelo. De color, te lo. Ponte lo rubio, ¿no? That's what it is. That's what I can do. <laughs> so drugs cannot make a cell perform a new function. They can only, guys, alter the way the cell is performing its current function, which is what we want with pharmacology. If the cells in your heart are giving you tachycardia, I want a medication that I can actually attach to B1 and decrease that. It's called a beta blocker, metropolo, or cardisin. Okay. So what I'm doing is I'm giving you medications to make the cell alter the way they're working at that moment one way of the other one either by antagonizing or by activating but either way i'm not changing the way they work i'm just tweaking how they are working at that moment antagonists and agonists and the whole pharmacology is full of them beta adrenergy beta blockers alpha adrenergy alpha blockers you understand what i'm telling you Cholinergic medications, anticholinergic medications. So the whole thing is made of, I'm going to activate you or I'm going to deactivate you and I'm going to speed you up or slow you down in a way. I'm going to vasoconstrict you or vasodilate you, depending on what I want. I'm, I'm doing it by giving you medications that travel to your body and attach to a cell and made that cell change what they're doing at a specific time. Is that understood? Yes. So far, so good? Yes. OK. So we're done with pharmacodynamics and, and pharmacokinetics. And I told you we were going to be here for 45 minutes. My bad. We were here for 57 minutes. Uh, but more or less, we got it, right? We got it. Now, once we know more or less 
the routes of administration, how do they work, what is biotransformation, what is bioavailability, why do which one of them actually metabolize in the liver, which one of them we need lower doses, why do we need lower doses for older people and for children, why do we need normal doses for normal people, I mean, younger person, everything we know, then we need to know how are we going to give it to your patients? Because believe me, if knowing this is important, knowing the right way of putting that medication in the system, it's even more important. Because depending on how you do it, is the way the pharmacodynamics and pharmacokinetics are going to work. If you use a smaller needle and you want to get into the muscle, what happens? It can break. No, you won't get into the muscle. You won't. You won't. Yeah, you won't it. And then if, you, small. if you don't get into the muscle, you're going to be short. What's going to happen? Instead of getting into the muscle, it could be subcutaneous. Or instead of being oh, subcutaneous, it could be intravenous. And then the bioavailability of that drug is different. Because I you were not supposed to give that amount of medication in that place of the body. And then that's why it's so important to pick the right needles. That's why it's so important to know which needles are we going to use to draw, which needles are we going to use to inject our patients, how many degrees are we going to use? Are we going to use 90 degrees? Are we going to use 45? Are we going to use 15? Why? Because depending on those degrees, it's where you're putting the medication. And believe me, it's not the same intradermal, that subcutaneous, that IV, that intramuscular. You are violating left and right a patient if you inject a medication in the wrong place. That's why sometimes, sometimes no, when you're doing an intramuscular medication, they tell you, one of the questions they tell you, shall we aspirate? Shall we aspirate? Yeah. Why are we aspirating? To make sure that- To do a C-track? 30 or a vein. To make sure there is no blood. And why do you need, we're not going to find blood intramuscular. Yeah, but if you use the wrong needle and the wrong angle, instead of being in the muscle, you're going to be in a vein. And then your medication is not going to be intramuscular, it's going to be intravenous. And it's a different story when it comes to bioavailability, when it comes to speed, when it comes to dosages, right or wrong. Yes. Hi. Hi. So, let's start with this. Intravenous, intramuscular, oral, portal circulation, first path metabolism, half life, rectal, sublingual, no first pass. Intertracheal, transdermal, sustained effect, rapid target, inhalation, local effect, subcutaneous. There are a bunch of them. And as nurses, you're going to have to know how to do them all. How about that? And you know, it's easy if you know the route and the technique that you use, and if you know the needle that you need to use. Once you know that, I mean, you might not know the medication per se entirely. You might not know all of the side effects. But at least if you're following the order correctly, the expectation is that the person who put the order in knows what, what the medication is being used for, right? You need to know everything else, guys, as part of your job. But this administration 
it's 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 pivotal because when you leave the university and you pass your NCLEX, so hopefully you're going to pass on the CSA exam also. By the way, because if you don't pass the CSA exam, you're never going to be able to go to your NCLEX. Uh, so once you do all that, don't talk about that, please. <laughs> all right, they're going to send you to a hospital, and right there, that's when that that's when things start. And if you know this, at least you know there's an there, there's there is a, a, a an advantage to it. What do you do before you give medication? Watch your hand. You watch your hands. Don't be a pig. It's not because of that. The reason why you're watching your hands is because the first form, the first way we propagate infections in a hospital is not doing this. Guys, you go inside, you watch your hands. You touch a patient, you watch your hands. You leave the room, you watch your hands. And well, it's but also because you can be touching other medications, so you need to. That's that's true. You but you're gonna have gloves and you're gonna take gloves. But that's the that, main thing, guys. Hospitals are full of you know what infection let me, prevention. Let me tell you a secret. Sick people. You know that you know that the hospitals are full of sick people. <laughs> full of sick people, and most of them. They are very sick, and you know what? Ten percent of those people that were not infected are going to get infected in the hospital. It used to be called nosocomial. You go to the hospital because you have pain in your toe, and you end up with MRSA. With pneumonia. <laughs> with MRSA, and maybe you know whose fault is that you have MRSA. The nurse. The nurse. The nurse. Yeah. He went to room three. Got out of. Then he went to room one and oh my god, gloves. Let me put gloves. This patient disgusting. But you already touched the patient and the bed and the sheets. And then the patient does that. And your patient had MRSA. Um, Room one had, and then two days later, you go see your patient. And he says, counter precaution. Why? This, this guy came for a pain in the toe. Why does he, in, why, why is he in contra precaution? There's nobody in the room with him. He's by himself. Ah, the nurse. Yeah. The nurse who even watches him. Second thing that you're going to do is that you're going to check your prescription. No matter how sharp you are, how good you are, how much do you think you know? Whether you were a a a, a doctor in, in in Argentina, in Cuba, or whatever, on how much you think you're good at it, and no. You check the original prescription and you compare it to the MAR. And you check your patient two times, and you check the medication three times. You make sure what you're giving the patient, it's what you're supposed to be giving the patient, and you're giving it to the right patient. So it's every medication three times. You don't open the meds until you get to the patient and you check your patient, make sure it's your patient and you double check your patient. And if your patient tells you, I don't recognize that pill, you go back and you check again. Because you know what? They've been sick for a long time. They know better the pills than you do. And then you ask your client whether he has a history of allergies. Guys, it doesn't matter if you look at the chart and it says no allergies. You know how many times these guys came in, God knows if they were totally oriented or whatever, and you go there at the time of giving the medication and you ask them, do you have any allergies? And he goes like, no, I don't think, so. oh, hold on, hold on, hold on. What are you going to give me? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I had an allergy of that a long time ago. You make sure your patient has no allergies and then you do your assessment. And for every medication that you're given, there is an assessment to be made. And the assessment includes objective and subjective. If you're giving your patients some diuretics, you have to make sure the potassium is right. Or the sodium is right. If you're giving your patient heparin, make sure he's not over anticoagulated. If you're giving digoxin, 
check the pulse. If you're giving beta blockers, check the block pressure, check the pulse. If you're giving nitroglycerin, check the blood pressure. The order is there. The function of assessing your patient before giving medication, it's your job. And in order for you to be able to do this, you need to know the medications. You need to know what heparin does. You need to know where diuretics are. You need to know what functions of the body are affected by diuretics. You need to know what digoxin does. What do we use it for? Warfarin. What's an INR? What's metropolol? What kind of medication? Is? What happened with the heart rate when it's contraindicated? Does my patient has a block? All of those things. So you need to know your meds. Some better than others, but you need to know them all. And you need to know your assess the assessment before you give medication to a patient. All of them, guys, believe me. 99% of the time, you're going to get away with it. One time, you're going to be in problem. And you're never going to be again. Once, once you're in trouble one time, believe me, from that moment on, you're going to get real scared. Follow the right medication, right dose, right client, right route, right time, right documentation, document in real time. Don't procrastinate. Make the appropriate calculations. Know what you're giving your patient. Check with other nurse for higher, higher drugs. It's a speed up process. So if you're giving blood, somebody else needs to be there with you. If you're giving heparin, somebody else needs to be there with you. Checking. Helping you. Check the drugs again in the EMR when taken with the other dispenser before opening immediately, before giving it to the patient. Don't check the medication after the patient swallow the medication. It, don't, it doesn't make a lot of sense. It may help you a little bit if you just swallow the medication, but if you swallow the medication already, that's a problem. Before, before. Administer the medication within 20, 30 minutes before or after the prescribed time. That's for NCLEX. The reality is that the hospital is going to give you a little bit more time because you're going to get a bunch of patients. And they're going to give you maybe an hour. And that, that's when stat comes along, because as soon as possible, doctors are going to say, I don't want you to do this within two hours. And I know the hospital is allowing you. I want this stat. And when it's stat, the medication should be administered within 30 minutes. It should always be within 30 minutes. But if you have nine patients and you're in the floor, it's a little bit difficult to start at nine o'clock and give everybody the medication by 9.30. So the hospital is gonna give you a little bit of time to give the medication. But if your order says stat, it means right away. Go and do it right away. Avoid incompatible medication like anti-axis, biosequestrant, or grapefruit juice. Those guys are not good guys. If you like grapefruit juice, I'm sorry. But if you're taking cash and channel blockers, no, I'm sorry, not for you, not for you, not for you, not for you. Identify the patient with two unique identifiers and stay with the patient until the patient has taken the drug. And if depending on the medication, you might need to stay a little longer. If you're giving your patient for the first time the penicillin, you need to stay there for half an hour if it's the first time that this patient takes penicillin. If you're giving the patient an opioid, it might be a good idea to wait a couple of minutes to see how your patient reacts, right? Oh, look, grapefruit. It inhibits tense intestinal enzymes and decreases their metabolism. If you are a grapefruit lover, it can increase the potency of some of the medication. So if you're taking carbamazepine, bospirone, lovastatine, verapamil, amlodipine, nifedipine, those are calcium channel blockers. Stop it. Grapefruit, not for you. And these are NCLEX questions. That's how they got you. After administration, do not recap needles. Even if you see them doing, don't people do it? All nurses, they go like, they think they are the matador, the bull. And some surgeons too, they go like, and I'm like, oh. 
most of the hospital have gotten smart and they have these safety things in the needles now. And, and still, I still see some of them with the needle, like, like, like they were D'Artagnan from the Musketeers. <laughs> Dispose in the right container. If it's a needle in the right container, if it's a medication in the right container, if it's bloody in the right container for blood. Don't get anybody sick because of your, of, of your laziness. Monitor the effects for side effects of the medications and evaluate the client for a therapeutic response. If you gave the client something to decrease the heart rate, go back and check. Pain, go back and check. Right, fever, go back and check. It's, it's, it's basic nursing process. Basic nursing process to go back and check for uh, medication administration. All control substances must be stored in a lock container requiring a key or a computerized access code for entry. This is lose your license, caca. Check. Lose your license. Believe me. You're going to give 50 of fentanyl and your buyer has 100. You're going to have to put your name, your fingerprint, get the fentanyl out, keep the fentanyl. Make sure somebody sees you getting away of the rest of the fentanyl. Go back to the to the pixies. Enter your name. Somebody's gonna have to come to you and enter their name. Both of you for the fingerprints, and you're gonna tell everybody. Two people are saying and getting rid of this fentanyl, right? Any part of a dose control? Yeah. I've recently seen that question already, like three times and like multiple tests that I've taken that same question like um that you need another nurse to to be there when you're um getting rid of narcotics Witness, yeah and 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 it's not because they wanted to do it because of the NCLEX world no it works like that in the hospital the first time the first time you Sorry, guys, just a minute. The first time you make a mistake, pharmacy sends a message to the director, and the director sends a message to the manager, and the manager to the church nurse, and they come and see you and they tell you, what happened here? But from that moment on, you are on their side. They're looking at you. The second time, you're in trouble. And from that moment on, they don't tell you, but he's having problems with narcotics. What is he doing? Is he taking them home? Is he selling them? Is he shooting them? You don't want to be in that list. And the list exists, believe me. I run a department. I know what I'm telling you. It's a CIA, FBI secret list. An inventory of record of all control substances is maintained, and you need to know you need to know how much you have. And every once a week, you need to do a count of those medications. Any part of the dose needs to be wasted and witnessed. And agency policies and procedures are followed with regard to the county of control substances at the end of the shift. Any discrepancy in the county is reported immediately. There's no escaping this. Control substance is a big deal. If you're going to give somebody a tablet, you know, there is something that is called a container cap. It's plastic. You put it in there and you give it to your patient. You don't put it in your hands, right? Enter encoded tablets and sustained relief tablets. You don't crush them. Not even if you're going to give it to the patient through a PET tube or an nasogastric tube. You don't crush those. You call the doctor and you call pharmacy and you get a different type of substance that you can flush yeah. through yeah. the PET tube. You know, you have crushers in the hospital, by the way, but those are not to be crushed. Just 
call the pharmacy. Listen, I need the same type of medication, but I need a liquid formulation of these medications. Any self-respect pharmacy is going to have a choice for you. Use a medicine cup at the level of your eyes. Volumes of less than five milliliters are measured with the use of a calibrated oral syringe. And an oral syringe or calibrated dropper is used to give medicine to a child. You do not give medicine to a child in a, in a cup. You know what the child is going to do? <laughs> That's what the child is going to do. Take this. Mm. Take it. I'm telling you. Mm. Come on. Take the medication for mom and dad. Mm, I don't want it. Take it. <laughs> no. Do it. Do it. Now you get a calibrated syringe and you put it here and you go like, Voof, and they go like, <gasps> and they swallow it. That's why. Scientific method. Use an oral or calibrated dropper to give medicine to a child. Place the teeth besides the tongue or use a nipple to do it. Do not mix medication with food or milk, especially in children. If you're going to give something because it's too bad, use jelly or applesauce for bitter medications. They're safe. If the patient vomits or the kids vomits, do not repeat the dose. Call the physician. Consult a doctor. Know if they want you to repeat the dose. So, so lingual under the tongue, right? Buccal between the cheeks. Your patient should not be drinking or eating while so lingual medications or buccal medications are, are, are being administered. And you follow the directions for dilution of shaking of the medication and you use the base of the meniscus at the level of the desire, like that one, like this. So you can measure the right amount. If you look at it like this, you might make a mistake. It could be more. You have to do it like this. Nasogastric and gastrostomy tubes. What's a nasogastric and what's a gastrostomy tube? What's the difference? One goes through the nose. Placement. Yeah. And the other one? Tracheal? Is directly to the stomach? No. One goes through the nose and the other one is connected, the pec tube. Right. So the idea is to have an access directly into the stomach. So one of them is a temporary solution. Patients that don't need to be fed for a long period of time, you could put an isogastric tube. So you measure it. And you put it through the nose all the way, so forth, into the stomach. And you measure CO2 and you measure everything and you make sure it's in the stomach. And that, if your patient is going to be there for just a few days because he's not able to swallow at the moment or any other reason, you can give your patient food and medicines to an NG tube. A patient who's not going to be able to swallow anymore or for a long period of time needs a different type of access and that is called a pec tube so there are two ways of putting a pec tube you could do you could put a pec tube by going in through the mouth all the way to the stomach with a special machine and open a hole from inside the stomach out or you could do a percutaneous gastrostomy tube placement which is from outside through an NG tube, and then you, you enter the pec tube through the mouth and you pull it. It's a gruesome, but it's very effective. Either way, what you're putting is a pec tube on this patient, and you have to check for residuals, and you have to do, use gravity when, when you're pushing a medication. You do not crash standard time release on terricoated medication on a pec tube ever. 
You do not mix medication with enter or feeding. Never. Feeding and medications do not mix. And you flush with lukewarm water. Why lukewarm water? To declog the... Well, you, water will do the trick, most likely. And some enzymes, yeah. if they're necessary, they will do the trick too. There's enzymes that can help and water. But when you're just flushing, why does it have to be lukewarm? Why not so cold? It helps so dilute water. faster, whatever is there. The cold water is going to the area temperature of the body. The density of the water is different. Of the body. One, one people, one people, one people. Cramps. 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 Cramps is the answer. Cramps. If you use cold water, cramps. And your patients don't want cramps. Sometimes I tell you the formula. Would you like to get cramps? No, you don't like cramps. No. Patients don't like cramps either, you know? Even if they have if they're if they're out of it, even if they have Alzheimer's, even if they are contracted like this, that they look like a, like 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 you know, like like really like nothing much, they still don't like cramps. And you shouldn't give them cramps. So use lukewarm water when you're flushing your pec tubes, right? Yes. That's NCLEX, that's you old, right? Yes. Yes. In which position is most appropriate to place a patient when administering medications via an asogastric tube? So, uh, supine, your patient is like this. Shoulder. Maybe not a good idea, right? Trent Ellenberg, your patient is like this, with the head down. Shoulder. Left side, like that. C come on, let me put you left side. No. Power position. Okay. Just move your patient a little bit like that and you give them the medication. IV, we got it. Subcutaneous, we got it. Intramuscular, we're all gonna see, we're gonna see all of those. Now, everybody know what rectal is, right? Yes. Yes. Through your butt. It's a very good way to give medication. Fast. It's fast, yeah. The absorption is so yeah. fast. Absorption is extremely fast. Bioavailability, very fast. You have to use something that is called Sims position. And this is Sims position right over here. This leg is extended. This leg is on top. And then once you do that, what do you do, you do next? You want to make sure the rectum is not full of poo poo. Because if your patient has a big turd inserted in his rectum, you're not inserting the medication in the rectum. The absorption is going to be, you and know what's going to absorb your medication? The, the poo. The poo poo. Yep. And then what's going to happen is that it's going to. Be Go out with the poo poo, so your patient is not never gonna get the medication, right? Yeah. So you stick your finger in. You make sure there is no poo poo. You look at it; it's not very nice. Wear a mask. Lubricate the suppository and insert at least one inch beyond the internal sphincter. So you need to know what the internal sphincter is, and you need to insert one inch over that. And you tell your patients, stay like that 15 minutes until the medication is in. And if it's a young person who you, you're doing that or, 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 or you're a male and he's a female, it's not a bad idea to have a witness doing that with you. And you don't have to have a witness for that? You don't have to. I'm giving you an advice as a, a, a nurse practitioner and a 23-year-old nurse. If it's a very young person and you're sticking your finger in the rectum, it's not a bad idea to have somebody with you there, if possible. 
Okay. If possible. I don't know if this is going to show up in the NCLEX, but you will remember in the future when you're there. I've seen people get into trouble. And then vaginal suppository, even worse. It's called lithotomy tom, tom, position. You lubricate the suppository and you insert it in to two to three inches towards the sacrum. Three inches towards the sacrum. It goes in, guys. It goes in. Instruct the client to remain in the supine position for 15 minutes. If you are a guy, I will advise you to have a female with you if you can. That's my advice. I don't know if they're going to ask you this in the NCLEX. I'm giving you an advice in case you ever work in a hospital. Parental medications. This is what I was telling you. Look, if you go down with the right needle, 90 degrees, you get to the muscle. You see that? But if it's not the right needle, it could become subcutaneous. Mm -hmm. It could become dermis or IV. So you need to know the right needles to use and the right degrees. These are the parts of the syringe. And this is the plunger where you measure your medication right here. These are type of syringes such as insulin and tuberculin. And these are different type of, uh, 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 depending on the needle, it's the type of injection you're going to do. For regular standard size or general use, you will use from uh, a 27 to a 2322. For oil, serums, or aspirations, you're going to use bigger needles, 20, 19, 18. For biopsies, you're going to go even higher, 12, 10, 9. Big needles, big needles for biopsies, for aspirations, for oil, for serums. Regular standards for general use. Vials don't have a risk of you having leftovers, ampules do, they do. So if you're gonna use an ampule, even if you don't think, don't think, just use a blunt filter needle when you're pulling up the, uh, uh, the, out the medication. Use it that way, use a blunt filter needle instead of using a regular needle. A blunt filter needle is gonna have a filter so whatever it is that is left over that you cannot even see inside the, inside the ampule, it's going to stay in the filter. Then you take off that one and you use the needle that you're going to use to inject the medication. You're following me so far? Yes. 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 We draw on a mixing insulin. You know? Inject 30 minutes, 30 units of air, get it out. First the N and then the R, right? Parental medication, general consideration. For kids, what do you use? For less than two years old, the vastus lateralis. Where is the vastus lateralis? Where is that muscle? The legs. In your legs. Legs. The legs. Right. Right next to your top. Two years. You can use the ventral gluteal side up to two milliliters, no more than that. I've seen crazy people injecting a huge amount of medications on patients in in the in the, in the ventral gluteal side, and I go like poor muscle. And for kids, no more than one milliliter of fluid. The ductal side can only accommodate on to one milliliter. That's why it's not very much used for regular injections. The tuberculin syringe. No, yeah. So that amount of fluid in, in when you're going to administer intramuscular applies for all the medications that you're yes. going to apply intramuscular? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's a muscle. You really want to put it No more. 
No more than one. Up to ml two milliliters. Right? Up to two milliliters. What do you want no, to put? Up to two. Okay. Yeah, up to two. What no, do you want to put? Because my shot. No, because I went to the doctor and they put. <laughs> I was thinking about that while I was at the doctor. They're crazy. And yeah, so I asked her. They're lazy. They don't want to inject twice. Yeah. They don't want to inject twice. So yeah. they go like, eh, three and a half. Eh, she's got a big butt. She can take it. Boom. There you go. And it hurts. Yeah. No, I and thought it, it was only the maximum of one. I know, no. Now I know this. That's for the vast lateralis in children less than two years old. Okay, listen. And that. after you're done with everything, discard the sharps. Right? Intradermal. The route is usually for tuberculin testing or checking for medication and allergy sensitivities. Use small amount of solution. Should be 0 0.01 to 0 0.1 milliliter in a tuberculin syringe with a very fine needle, 20 seed of 27. Let's say bigger is not better. Bigger doesn't mean bigger in needles. The bigger the needle is, the thinner it is, the number. The smaller it is, the, the bigger it is. The bigger it is. So a 2627 is a very fine needle. Very, very fine needle. And you should do it at 10 to 50 degree angle. Guys, this This here, and that's an anchor's question. It's normal. You don't call 911. You're supposed to see that. it. In those You're supposed to see it. That's an expected thing. Oh, look what I did. No, you don't call 911. That's an expected thing. That's something that you should happen if you're doing intradermal. It's under the epidermis. That's that's what it is. It's an expected thing. Commonly What's used lab. Hey, sir, I'm sorry. And how is the question in NCLEX? It should. I'm going to I have a, actually I'm going to give you like 20 something questions and, and let's wait. Yeah, yeah. I, oh my God. One hour and 35 minutes. This is going to be longer than two hours today. I'm sorry, guys. I mean, but you already here. Soak it up. Uh, <laughs> Commonly used for insulin and heparin, it will be three and an eighth to five and an eighth inch. So it's not very, it's not very uh, uh, big. 25 to 27 needle. So it's a small needle thing. You're not going to inject more than one milliliter of, sol of solution. And for the average side client, you're going to pinch your skin and inject a 40 wide to 90 degree angle. And you're going to tell me what, 90 degrees is for for intramuscular, yeah, but not for this type of injection because the needle is very short. So you oh. put 45 or 90 and it's never going to pass where it should pass. Yeah, because that be, we can only we can only use the 27 needle. A, a 27 and a 3 and an A and a 5 and an A, a inch for, for, for insulin and heparin. So it's going to stir subcutaneous. It's never but, gonna go. That's the way to do it with, with Lovenox. Have you seen a Lovenox injection? Yes, yes. Lovenox injections come prepared already. It's a yes. syringe. It's a syringe. So when you inject that, what you're doing is that you're looking for the fat in the belly and you go 90 degrees. No matter how deep you go, your your needle is gonna be three and an eight, five and an eight inches, 25 to 27. So it's a fine needle, short one you won't be able to pass subcutaneous tissue. In the case of Lovenox, well, it's already pre-prepared. But if you're going to inject uh, uh, some sort of a medication that it has to be uh, 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 subcutaneously, and you don't have a pre-prepared, you need to know what needle you're going to use. You need to know that. Sites are selected for adequate pad, pad sites, abdomen, upper hips, lateral, upper arms, sides, places where you're gonna go into subcutaneous tissue. Rotate the size of injection with the same anatomic area. You don't wanna create a hole there. And when you're doing that, aspiration of blood, it's not required. 
Why is it not required? Because you're going to go all the way to where you need to go. With the right needle, that's that's an example. Ventrogluteal. You divide the buttocks and you go outside, or you use. You find the iliac crest, the anterior superior iliac spine. You put your arms, and in there you inject. If you want to be a hundred percent sure, whether it is on the right or, or the left, it's not that difficult to find the iliac crest and anterior, anterior superior iliac spine. And right there, it's gonna it's gonna be the same as dividing that in four and going out. Deltoid, right here, and this is the famous vastus lateralis in kids. The injection should go right here, in the middle of the upper third of the vastus lateralis. That's when you put your injection. Parental medications intramuscular. The most common side for adults will be the ventrobutal, the deltoid, or the vasculaturalis in pediatrics. You're going to use a side needle of 20 to 25. That's a bigger one. Mm -hmm. Even at 25, it's, it's, it's not that much, but at 20, at 20, it's. Have you seen a 20? Yes. Yes. Yeah, because you want to run. You're going to give me what? And you do it at 90 degrees. Bottom injection is usually one to two milliliters. If you need more than that, two shots. Two shots. Right? For small children, again, no more than one milliliter should be injected. And in the deltoid, no more than one milliliter. You could use some techniques that will help you. You could use airlock and C track. C track, especially when, when some iron solutions are being used. Why would you use that? Basically, so want, you want to prevent the medication so from spread outside the muscles. Mm -hmm. Is that so understood? Yeah. Isn't it also because it could stain the skin? That's right. Or and it hurts. For instance, if you use if you use air lock, you gonna your medication up to here and zero one to so zero two milliliters of air. Once you inject, you inject into the muscle, right? But then after that, you inject the air. What do you think is going to happen? This is black here, guys, by the way. So what do you think is going to happen? It's going to be air here. And that air is going to push the medication down. And it's going to prevent the medication from living. And air, uh, this is the, I'm sorry, this is this is the air lock here when what is done. You see it? That's your medication here. It's your air there. Inside of where it's supposed to be. So it works. You draw you, you do, do, do draw your mat and you draw 1.2 air, and people go like, oh, air, air in the body. Yeah, air in the body. If it goes into the muscle, nothing's gonna happen. And then I am injections that prevent medication from leaking back into the subcutaneous tissues. You could use the C track technique. If it irritates the skin, stain, certain arms preparation, you should use C track. You withdraw liquid with filter needle first. You replace it with a one and a half inch new needle. You do not spare air. You pull the skin and dip a pull. You do an IM injection like you usually do. And then you release the skin and then it is removed and you don't massage. If you want to really see how C track is done, just Google it in YouTube. In YouTube. And you'll see many samples of C track technique. 
in case you ever get an order, I want this medication, use the C-track technique. Especially uh, certain iron preparations if you're working in very uh, specific areas, right? The nurse is preparing to administer intramuscular medication using air lock to prevent leakage of the medication into the subcutaneous space. Which amount of air should the nurse withdraw for the air lock? Zero, 0.01. I mean, zero, 0. 0. 0. 0.1. 0.02. Oh, 0.02. Oh. Oh, it's up to, it's up to, it's up to one. 0. 0.02. Oh, it's up to 0.02. All right. Parental, intravenous. Anything that you're given a patient intravenous is going to require what? A venous access. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, obviously. <laughs> obviously, right? Yeah. <laughs> you should have a venous access if your patient is receiving venous medication. Because every single time you're going to inject the medication, you're not going to stick your patient. You want an access that can be reused. If you don't have a venous access, a vascular access, you know what your patient is going to do to you? She'll tell you the second time that you go, bugger off. You already stuck me once, you're not doing it again. So what you're doing is you put an access in the patient, a vascular access device for short term or long term in case it's necessary. If your patient is a trauma patient and you're going to treat a trauma patient, you're going to use a huge needle, 16. For surgical clients, trauma and surgical, huge needles, 16 and 18. Why? Because a surgical crime might need a blood transfusion during surgery. So you need a very big vein. 22 to 24 for children, older adults, medical clients, some patients who are not going to be there for a long time. That's just a, a small vascular access just to do something. And after that, you get rid of it for a little bit longer term or for surgical or trauma patients who are exposed to a variety of treatments, you need bigger needles, especially if you're going to use pressors. You want a big vein. Because if you don't get a big vein and you extra vase with pressors, for instance, your patients might lose a limb. If you're transfusing blood, it's thick. You need, you need a nice vein. Preferred size are peripheral veins in the arm of the hand and in neonates, veins of the head, lower legs, and feet might be used. You shouldn't use feet in adults. Not at all. That's, that's, that could be a big issue. Benny puncture. That's a Benny puncture. You see it? Learn to do this now while you're students. Practice as much as you can. Not that difficult. Not that difficult. Not the same as actually sticking a person, but it's, you, you can learn it. Uh, you have to avoid an arm that has dermatitis or cellulitis or, or it's swollen or, or, you know, you shouldn't touch that. Paralyzed arm are a no-no. Uh, mastectomy uh, arms are a no-no. Lympho lymphoedema, AV shunts, fistulas, patients who have dialysis, those are arms that you don't touch. If you see a dialysis uh, shunt or, or, or a fistula, you don't touch that. You never touch that. If you see an arm that is full of, 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 of dermatitis, if, you, if the patient had a stroke, this arm is paralyzed, don't touch it. I had a mastectomy. Left, left, left breast mastectomy. Don't touch the left arm. They, the whole thing change there. The vasculature is going to be changed. You don't want to do that, right? You're going to lower the arm and you're going to visualize your veins. You're going to put a tourniquet. You're going to leave it there no more than two minutes if possible. 
but you're going to have to want to have a juicy vein that you can feel, not only see, feel it, right? You're going to clean circular and you're going to practice belly puncho before you do it to your clients. Go to that rubber arm and stick the rubber arm 150,000 times. I'm still, you're still going to miss a couple of times when you start doing it on patients. It's not the same. But practice makes perfect. After blood flows, you release the tourniquet, you fix this catheter here. You take that, you, you press that button. You see that white button here? You see that? Yeah. That's going to retract the needle. You go in with the needle and then you put the catheter in and you put the needle a little bit back. As soon as you get this here, you see, you, you see what this is? This is blood. It's telling you that you're there. I am in the vein or I should be in the vein because you could you could be over because remember most of the time if you're if you're doing any puncture or you're putting a peripheral IV catheter, you're not using an ultrasound machine. So you're not 100% sure, but if you if, if you get a nice flow back and then you push the vein and then you press that white button and you take the needle, you retract the needle and you use this catheter here. You see this? And you connect it to this here. And magically it matches. And then you use this here and you put a syringe there and you pull back. And as soon as you pull back, you're going to see the flow of blood. And that's going to tell you I'm in vain. And then, I'm sorry, and then you're going to flush it. You're going to you're going to initiate the IV and you're going to flush it after you give medication always. Before and after giving medication. Before to make sure your IV is patent. After giving medication to make sure the medication is in the vascular system. Is that understood? This is a peripheral device. This is more used by, by nurses. This is a port. You will never put a port. Only an interventional radiologist or a surgeon does this. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a micro level and I work with an interventional radiologist. I don't put ports. Not even my scope of practice as a nurse practitioner allow me to put ports. Only an NIR physician or, or a doctor or, or a surgeon. Big lines are done by nurses. Yes. Instead of going through the neck, you go through the arm. You find a very good vein there, the basilic vein, and you go all the way into the superior vena cava. And you, you're always at risk of going inside the heart, by the way. This is done by nurses using ultrasound machine. Uh, and this is a central catheter that is done by ARMPs and doctors. All of those are vascular devices to draw blood, give medications, and so forth. As a piggyback infusion, if you need to, you need this to go faster, you just use a little bit of a, um, uh, you put it up, this one down, and the piggyback is gonna go first, and after it happens, the primary set is gonna keep on running. It's just, if you have this kit bay open here, and you need to, you don't have a, 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 a machine and you need to infuse a medication, then you could use it that way. This is administer medication through a primary tubing. You clap the tubing so the medication doesn't go back into the main uh, 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 IV. And you use one of the ports that these uh, lines have and you can just keep the medication and then you flush. That's that's a uh, 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 This is uh, you see, call and swelling. Parental medication, administration of intravenous opioid analgesia through uh, um, fentanyl. You need infusion pumps, and you're doing this to an epidural needle. You don't put epidural needles. That's not done by you. That's done by a CRNA or an anesthesiologist. Eye drops. 
Lean the patient head backwards, looking outward. You see it there? With your dominant hand, rest on the forehead, and you hold the, you hold the dropper about quarter of an inch to an inch. You do not touch the eyelid with the dropper. You don't want to go like, boom, and hit the guy with the dropper. You don't do that, all right? And you gently close the eyelids and you move the eyes. Patient shouldn't squeeze the eyelids and blah, 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 blah. Ointments, they are done there. You see it there? This is self-explanatory, guys, right? Ear drops. This confused the hell out of people. In adults, you pull the ear back and up. In kids, you pull the ear back and down. Right, back and down. anti anginal and transdermal patch of men. You remove the old patch, always. You might think it doesn't have any medication, it still does. And after you've done it, you make sure you put it in a safe place. Kids and dogs, they love to go through the trash. You do not want your kid and your dog, and believe me, on the three years old, they got the same brain. Same brain, they think very much alike. So they could go and lick the fentanyl patch. Hmm. Not a good idea. So mine will go and do it. <laughs> yeah. To avoid touching the inside of the patch of the omen, you wear gloves, you look for something without hair. And you do not rub the ointment. You rotate the site all the time. And in the case of nitroglycerin, you remove it for tolerance. The inhaler, check the inhaler. Remove the mouthpiece. <sighs> Breathe. Spare the air. Put it in the mouth. Place the lips secure on top of it. <sighs> Push it off and inhale. Hold the breath for a few seconds, two seconds, three seconds, and then slowly. If you need it again, wait a couple of minutes. Before a minute. A bronchodilator, a buterol, and a buterol. It's a sava, right? It's always used before a lava. S a b a l a b a. So, a short-acting beta adrenergic, it's always going to be used before a long-acting one. Meaning, most likely, if your patient is having an acute asthma attack, he's going to get a butyl first. And then whatever it is. The question says, a butyl, and then uh, another medication, and then antibiotics. The first one you're going to use is a short-acting. It's indicated for asthma always, the short acting one. Is that clear, guys? Yes. I have two what? questions like with that. Yeah, like questions. Like albuterol with uh, uh, corticosteroids. Which you one use the albuterol first. Or, or different hydramine. Which one do you, you use? use the albuterol first. Yeah. Always. Always. Questions and answers. It's two. Or administering yeah. any medication, what is the nurse prior reaction regarding patient safety? Checking the, we have to check the patient uh, ident identification. Identification. We said that, right? Yes, we have to make sure this is yeah. in the correct patient. You identify, yes, how many so identifiers identify do you use? How many and identifiers? So, Two. Two identifier so, minimum, right? Yes. And you check the nine rights because we're up to nine rights now of the patient medication administration. Used to be six rights. Now we're up to nine rights. And I think it's more. I heard this semester that it was more. Patients keep on getting rights. You have to respect them. I'm sorry. So, yeah. Verifying the patient identifying two identifiers before administering any medication is essential for patient and, uh, and check the nine rights of medication administration. 
and document in real time. The nurse is giving an intraderma injection and will choose which syringe for this injection. Intraderma? Yeah. Um, the smallest one? The, the one in the... The second one. A, B, C, D. They don't have number. Huh? C, A, B, A, B, C, or D? B. B. Right. Remember, one B. milliliter. Oh, one remember, minute, like... remember, the maximum is one milliliter. So if that one has a hundred units, that one units is not exactly for that. It will be more for insulin, right? Yes, that's the reason. Well, that this is five milliliters here, and this is five milliliters here. Those are big syringes. So we use the one milliliter. You want the one milliliter one? Yes. Robert side, it's one milliliter tuberculin syringe. The other syringe pictures are incorrect there. The patient is to receive penicillin intramuscular injection in the ventroglutal side. The nurse will choose which angle near injection. Intramuscular, 90, 90, 90 degrees. With the right angle right syringe, right? 90 degrees, yeah. 90 degrees. 90 degrees. The other angles are incorrect. When administer medication by IV bolus push, the nurse will occlude the IV line for which method? Remember what I told you, you have to do something. You, you have your whole thing. And then you, you want to keep the medication. You, 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 you do something, you, you, you pinch something. So the medication don't go back up. Pinching it to the uh, the above yes. the injection port. That is correct. Yes, above the injection port. You do that. Te vas a caer. Ven para acá. Ven para aquí. The nurse has an order to administer an intramuscular immunization to a two-month-old child. Which D. child is correct? D. The, the, D. Uh, D. The, the, the vastus lateralis. Remember that we said that, right? Vastus the vastus lateralis. lateralis is preferred for infants under two years old, right? Yes. The other side is not appropriate for, insta for infants. Vastus right? uh, 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 uh. Uh, the toy is only for uh, uh, immunizations uh, and, uh, uh, and and the other ones are just not for that. Uh, the dorsal glutal size no longer recommended because of the possibility of nerve injury. The nurse will to use the C-track method of intramuscular injection for which situation? Not to be efficient. Okay. That's right. Remember, we were talking about medication, actual medication that can irritate the skin mm -hmm. tissues. So the answer is right there. Okay. Any medication that irritates tissues, right? Sure. Oh, After oh, oh, oh. administering an intradermal injection for a skin test, the nurse noticed a small blip at the injection site. Which of these is the best action for the nurse to take at this time? C. C. Do nothing. C. Do nothing. C. It is expected. Yep. Not do anything. Do not yeah. call 911. Do not apply heat. Do not massage the area. And definitely do not call the physician at 3 o'clock in the morning. He's going to be very upset. Okay. The nurse is administering an IV push medication through an IV lock. After injecting the medication, which action will be taken next? Flush. Flush in the lock. Flush and lock. The lock. Uh -huh. We spoke about that. We just spoke about that, right? Yes. You flush after flush before. That's right. When adding medication to a bag of intravenous IV fluid, the nurse will use with methods to mix the medication. We didn't speak about this, by the way. It's B. That's right. You turn the back of the bottle gently to the other side. Mm -hmm. You don't mix it. Some medications don't like to be moved mix or mixed. Or they get full of air, right? Mm -hmm. So when medications are added to IV fluid containers, the medication and the IV solution are mixed by holding the back 
of butter and turning it to the end, mixing it gently. Shaking vigorously is not appropriate. Inverting the bag just once or simply allowing the bag to stand for 10 minutes might not be sufficient to do it. So the way to mix it, it's... The nurse is measuring four milliliters of liquid cough elixir for a child. Which method is the most appropriate? For a child? Oh. Yeah. This Remember that I spoke about no, no, don't give don't give yes a, don't give a teaspoon. I think it's D. 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 Yeah, it's B. B. It's B. B. D. Holding the medication cup. Yeah, D. I mean B. D. D. That's you right. just it's D. D. You just just the throw. Calibrate a syringe mm. and you shove it. Shove oh, it up. Calibrating yes the the syringe. Oh, While the nurse is assisting a patient taking his medication, the medication cup falls to the floor, spitting the tablets. What is the nurse's best action at this time? A. Discard the medication. Right. Please, do not give the medication from the floor. No. That's worse than not washing the hands. We have a, a rule of five seconds. <laughs> <laughs> Not even in the restaurant, Zachary. Not even in the restaurant, brother. <laughs> when giving a buccal medication to a patient, which action by the nurse is appropriate? Patient to swallow. Do you tell them to swallow the medication? No. See. C. C. Or D. Tell me. Yeah. Place the tablet under the patient tongue and allow the. No. Under the no, patient tongue. Buco is C. Buco. It's a C. It's a C. Placing the medication between the upper and lower molar. The first two are PO. The last one is lingual. C. B in the cheek. Like this. Right here. Between the upper or the lower molar teeth and the cheek. Yeah, but I see, but mostly I don't see like mostly they do the sublingual like for example captopril. Whenever someone come in and with the house, we give it like sublingual captopril, but don't we do don't. That. Do, don't do that. Don't do, yeah, I see. Long time we don't do that anymore. No, no, no. You can't do that with captopril. No, <laughs> just don't do it. It's not do it, it, it mostly. It. <laughs> no, we captopril. No, don't do that. Don't <laughs> Exactly. If, if, if they tell you to do that, you tell them that nah, cactopril is not so lingual. Yeah. If you want me to give a nitroglycerin, I'm fine with it. The nurse is giving medication through a percutaneous endoscopy. Endoscopy it means that it was done through the mouth. Percutaneous, the other one would be through the belly. This one was a peg tube that was done through the mouth. That's endoscopy. That's trostomy peg. Which technique is correct? That's true, I think. D. Yeah, there is a key word here. Which one is it? The key word here is gravity. 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 Yes, the D. You have That's to right. The That's right. The medication by gravity. I uh, hope uh, that we can, are going to be able to do that in the hospital. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> <laughs> The nurse is about to give a rectal suppository to a patient, which just means to facilitate the administration and a subtor of the rectal suppository. I don't no. tell you the name, but I do tell D. you the position. And encourage the patient to lie on his D. or her left side for 15 to 20 minutes after insertion, make sure the suppository is in a clean buttox and there is no poo poo in it. Yeah. yeah, inserting yeah. one, one inch. Right. The patient is receiving eye drops that contain beta blocker medication. The nurse will use what method to reduce systemic effect after administer the eye drops? And that was there. Would it be? D, apply gentle D. pressure. That is the answer. That is the answer. A two-year-old is to receive eardrops. 
The nurse is teaching the parent about giving the eardrops, which statement reflects the proper technique for administering eardrops to a child. See. Uh, oh, this is down, like down, up for the adult child. Right. Yeah, right. Back and down, back and down, back and down. Yeah, back down. Yeah, bound for, for kid, up oh, for father. And down, back. OBC. Strain the ear canal <coughs> by pulling the peanut down and back. And back, yes. Right. Patient with asthma is to begin medication therapy using a meter dose inhaler. What is the important reminder to include during the teaching session sessions to the patient? Remember, B. That's right. You 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 get the air down and you inhale slowly by pressing down the release medication, and then you wait. And then if you need another dose, you wait for a couple of minutes before you do it, right? When giving medications to the nurse, we'll use standard precautions would include what action? Standard precautions with needles. Just go in. D, D. Not in the trash can. Contain in the puncture or the container. container. D. 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 You do it in the trash can, a guy that doesn't know anything about nursing or medicine is going to come and he's going to pick it up and he's yep. going to pinch himself. I was reading fast. Yeah. <laughs> The patient says he prefers to chew rather than swallow pills. One of the pills have the abbreviation SR behind the name of the medication. The nurse needs to remember which correct instruction regarding how to give this medication. See. You do not crush it. No, do not crush. Do not yeah. crush. Do not. Not for the Never crush. Tube, not for the pet tube. Not for the patient who wants to crush it. Do not crush it. Yeah, call the pharmacy, ask for another. Ask for another yeah. medication or tell your patient, listen, if that's what the order and that's what you're going to take, I'm really sorry, my dear, but you're going to have to swallow the pill. You can shoot the pill. Professor, what is SFR? Slow release. Slow release. Ah, the slow release. Okay. It's okay. the way it works in the body. It's longer. It's a slow release. Extending release. And administer nasal spray, which instruction by the nurse is appropriate. You may need to blow your Same nose. as the COVID vaccine. I'm, so, I'm sorry, as the COVID test. What did they used to do to you? Hey. 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 You nose before. You blow the nose mm -hmm. and then I give you the medication. Think about that always. Nasal spray, blow the nose first, let me give you the medication later. The nurse is preparing to give an accus. Accus, remember the needles. There were accus and there were oily needles. Intramuscular injection to an average size adult. Which action are appropriate? Select all that apply. Do you use a 2627 or a 2025? 2025. B. 2025. So B is one of them, right? Mm -hmm. Do you choose the dorsal gluteal side for a guy, for a normal person? No. No, it's intro. No, it's ventral. That's right. He is one of them. Do you insert the needle at 45 degrees angle? No, no, no. No, no. no. we do 90 degrees. 90 Eight. degrees angle and before injecting the medication if it's an intramuscular medication would you yes. withdraw the plunger to check for blood return yes yes, yes. you yes. don't want to be in a vein yeah it's, so it will be b in e and f right b, yeah, yes we're done Ta -da -da. we were here for two hours and a few minutes that's that pretty good. good. Thank, Thank you, you so much. I Thank hope you. it was good, guys. Uh, yeah, professor, yeah, what, what, yes. what, what will we do doing the 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 dosage calculation? That's that is like uh, I can do that next week. Yes, please. Okay, Should, that would be nice. I can do dosage calculation next week, and maybe I can do medication errors. I'm starting with the things that are not medication like. I'm starting with things that are for you to understand pharmacology, then we're going to go through all of the medication things. 
And when we're done with everything, we're going to have a boot camp that has about 200 slides that is going to cover the whole pharmacological thing in six hours. That day, we're going to meet here at five o'clock, and you're going to go home at 11. Okay. <laughs> when is going to be there? Right. Before October? <laughs> before October. Oh, that's great. Okay. So I'm planning to take yes, like ma'am. Before. before October. <laughs> okay. So I'm really happy that you guys are coming. Please keep on coming. Thank you. Thank you so much for your time and your help. Are you giving the boot camp on Monday? Come again? There's a boot camp on Monday at six. Are you giving That's, the boot No, I'm giving pharmacology Fridays at uh, eight. Dr. Bajing. Dr. Bajing. And listen, Monday, sorry, Bajing. if you think I'm a little bit good, you have not seen Bajing. The guy is fantastic. Okay, it's on Monday our time? Yeah, six? he's really six. good. Yeah. Six, six, nine, listen, you day. will hear you will hear Dr. Bajing's in your head, his voice yes. when you're doing the NCLEX. I, no, yes. I had that experience in the Hesse that I practiced that I passed, the CSA clearance. I had that experience. That yeah. I, I listened to the book and, and like three or four questions about infection control. They were straightforward the from the guy is unique. his mouth. The guy is unique. People pay a lot of money to go see yes. this guy. Yes. And you have him for free. I have friends that go to other school and they pay. When do we have him? And they told me, you're so lucky because you go to MRU and he works, you know, he works for you guys. So she was like, yeah. So guys, sign the attendance so they know that you're coming to the boot camps. Um, See you on Friday, next Friday. Another two hours of, of being here. I'm Thank very you so much. Here. Thank, Thank you for your time. Have a Thank you. Thank Bye. you. Thank Bye. you, Professor. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye, Professor. Thank you. Bye, guys. Good night. Look at this. Good night. My baby fall asleep right now. <laughs>